thank you very much for the invitation. It's a great pleasure to be doing, to be co-organizers in this thing. And um, I will start by saying, first of all, that in, in pure strict logic, my presentation is a problem and an obstacle to all of you because it's standing between you and your lunch. So we'll try to correct that and do it very quickly. The second thing is that as I was doing some research, looking into um, you know, global and, and social perceptions about AI and how things go, I came up with a lot of that. So I realized that uh, if I stick to what you read you know, on social media and everything, we shouldn't talk at all. We should just decide that we have to party as much as we can, have a lot of fun, go for sunbathing, have a lot of food, lots of drinks. Don't worry about the extra kilos because there will not be any tomorrow. So um, there's no point in doing anything because AI will use us as its food. Now, uh, this probably will not happen though. And I think that we can look at how AI is helping us and can help us find solutions in terms of sustainability. And you don't need to even try to read the stuff that is up there because we'll discuss about it uh, in the next few minutes. But before we do this, I want to go a little bit back in time because we have this big discussion about what are the issues that are coming towards humanity because of the development of AI. And one of the things we need to keep in mind is that human brain is not wired in a way to, to deal with multi-dimensional problems. It's easier for humans to think about one problem and try to solve it and disregard all of the rest. So one example that I want to share with you is industrial revolution. Industrial revolution started in the 1800 something. Uh, the big stuff started happening in the beginning of the 1900s. And it was a time when people realized that they can use a lot of condensed, if you like, energy. Energy that was coming mostly out of carbon at the time, of coal, um, to replace the physical effort they had to do to produce goods, food, and everything. So they were now sitting behind the machine and making the machine do the work. What humans did not realize, or actually what they started thinking, does anybody know the movie Modern Times? This is Charlie Chaplin, 1936, and that was a very characteristic movie that was showing that the Industrial Revolution would actually replace humans, make them become used by the machines, and also that they would all lose their jobs. The main thinking of humans at the time was this. We're replaced by the machines, we will lose their jobs. Does it sound familiar? It does. Uh, at the time, because humans could not actually relate to the other big issues, they forgot or they did not manage to see some other issues that were happening. Uh, by the way, losing their jobs. This is a graph that shows how the unemployment was going through from the 18, 1880, 1860, until almost nowadays. And it's very interesting to see that the, oops, sorry. All the fun is gone now. <laughs> So the Industrial Revolution actually did not change the patterns of unemployment. The pattern of unemployment stayed exactly the same. You had some very high peaks, which was the uh, big uh, economic crisis in the 1930s and then with the World War that followed. You had some issues related to natural effects and everything. But actually, people did not lose their jobs because of, of um, the Industrial Revolution. They had to change. They had to readapt. They had to make a lot of changes, but not Unemployment did not soar as it was expected. However, humans forgot to notice a couple of other things that were very important. That the Industrial Revolution, because it was using a lot of fossil fuels, first coal and then gasoline, led to this. And this led actually humans to start using Industrial Revolution and, and lots of energy in very creative and very useful ways like this one. Um, so we got used to having a lot of energy to have fun with, you know, to enjoy ourselves and everything. So we did a lot of stupid things as a, as, a, as a human race. And as a result, this is what happened. Nobody had thought that this might be one of the effects of the Industrial Revolution. But it did happen. And what happened because of climate change, this is what actually what you see here, is the trend of temperature, the mean temperature in the world. These are the, the spikes, if you like, in, in temperature. And it's now proven, unfortunately, that we have a big raise in global temperature. This is a picture I have taken myself. This is just over the mountains of uh, Chamonix in France. This is where the glacier was standing in 1990. Um, now, 
in 2022 that I took this picture of this is a cave. You cannot even see the people. The distance from here to here is 160 meters deep. So the glacier since 1990 has gone down 160 meters. This is climate change. People could not think about it, could not think of the side effect that this was creating as we were doing a very big change in the way that we produce, we live and everything. The other thing that came with the Industrial Revolution was that we could produce much more food. We had machines that could till the ground, we had fertilizers, again very much based on using a lot of energy, and we could feed a lot more people, which was great because people had a problem surviving in many cases, there was a lot of hunger and everything. There was a side effect that, again, nobody thought of, and this was the loss of biodiversity. Look at this line here, around the 1900s, how all of the lines for the loss of amphibians, of mammals, of birds, of reptiles, of fishes, is jumping. We started losing exponentially more species per year, per day, practically, and this was a result of actually tilling the ground to do more agriculture and also doing a lot of other things that were not very good for, for all of these poor animals. Um, another very important thing that came with the Industrial Revolution was the advent and the development of medical science. Medical science came a very long way. This is one of the first pictures of polio vaccination back in 1954. And again, this was a fantastic thing. On the other side of the coin, what nobody thought of was this. This is the uh, increase of population on the world. Look at that. You have an almost flat line. This is the rate of increase of human population up to around 1880, 1890, and then in the 1900s, the line jumps. And this is an increase of population that actually hits a tableau in 1968, then it starts going down, but the actual number of population goes up. And this, it's not a problem per se. Human population is not a problem in itself. It's how you manage to give up, to provide the resources and manage the resources that all of these humans need. There were other things that were connected with all this growth of population and technologies. One of them is the hunger map. Uh, so we said that we're producing a lot more food, but food is not equally distributed. So you have places like what you have in Central Africa, for example, or in some parts of, a of Asia, where people cannot secure one meal per day. And this is a very big problem because it leads to health issues, to education issues. It is like, you know, a domino effect. Uh, same thing with the burden of disease. We have not solved the problems around the world, not only because of COVID. We have many cases. I was speaking with a friend who was working with UNDP in South Sudan uh, three years ago, and I asked her how things are going with COVID there. And she said, Spiro, people here have so big problems in terms of feeding themselves or having other diseases that they have not even noticed the presence of COVID, if that gives you any sense of how bad things can be in those parts in Africa. Um, and of course, there was a lot of, of these things that happened, and uh, people have been, humans have been trying, and governments have been trying to address those issues. And one of the most important points in global response to all of these problems was the, who knows what this is? The SDGs. Thank you very much. It's the 17 goals that were um, actually agreed by all of the countries of the world in this historic UN General Assembly in 2015. And they are trying to address all the major issues, poverty, hunger, health, education, gender equality, water and sanitation, renewable energy, and so on and so forth. 17 of them that are actually the crystallization, if you like, of all the big challenges that humans are facing nowadays. Um, and the definition of sustainable development actually came many years before that. It came in 1987 in another General Assembly of the United Nations, and it says, many of you will know it, that development, sustainable development, is the one that meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. This makes total sense now. Before 1987, nobody had thought that they could put that in a phrase. And what it actually does, and not many people actually realize this, is that it's the first time that in legal terms and in political terms, we have the responsibility between generations. This never existed before. So it is a very, very big shift in the way that we see not only development, but also the sense of law, the sense of justice and everything. And uh, you might have heard that sustainable development is the one that meets the needs of the environment or the planet 
of society, but also of economic development. If you cannot match those three together, it's not sustainable. It might be in the case of having, you know, good for the environment and society, a bearable result, or it might be an equitable result if you have the economic and human or a viable one, but it's not sustainable. You need to have all three pillars in place to make it happen. And let's see how the UN Sustainable Development Goals and Artificial Intelligence get together. Before I come to this, there are already things that we can consider like side effects of AI that are happening that are very rudimentary, very day-to-day -day things that not many people know of. Can you think of one example that ChatGPT, for example, creates in terms of schooling? Does anybody know an example of that? Yes, please. On Loud the voice. On? Explain. Explain. Uh, when uh, we most likely have to uh, redesign all our syllabi, because most of the papers, don't talk subjects, and other things that students can do, even if right now they can uh, go to ChatGPT or similar AI exactly. systems, we don't know easily if they are generated by themselves or by. Precisely. AI. Or to put it in other terms, in English-speaking schools, not a single kid is doing homework. <laughs> Actually, in Greek, uh, in English, in Greek too. In Greek too, because yeah, it's like the kid can respond in Greek as well. So no problem with that. So I mean, speaking personally, being a very bad student when I was in school, that's not necessarily a bad thing. Uh, because you might actually learn a couple of things as you're playing with ChatGPT. But seriously speaking, it is an issue. Yes, please. Um, I think also teachers may be old uh, problems because I mean I was a student that when I was not interested in the topic I went to the media and I copied yeah. by yeah. hand now it's a task but I also copied whatever I was given exactly. to do and they could go to Wikipedia there's, there was a lot of the, this everything on the internet so I think that that GPT is not creating exactly and there's a lot of deja vu in the issues that we see thank you very much for that that comment. So uh, before we look into what AI can do to address the sustainability and SDG issues, let's see how many of you have heard the, the term megatrends. Can I see some hands? Megatrends, what you see up there, this word. So megatrends are the big trends that are happening in humanity and in the world, and they are powerful transformative forces that could or will change the global economy, the business and society. And let's see some of them. These are, I have put up there the seven biggest ones. One of them is urban growth. It's amazing if you think that almost 70% of human population will be living in urban areas by, by 2050, 70%. This is almost more than the actual population that we have now in the world will be living in big mega cities. That's an issue that we will have to address. Girls' education. Increasing girls' education is a very important point for the future of population growth in Africa and the world. And I will show you a diagram in a couple of minutes about that. Inequality. Inequality not only in terms of economic equality, which is very important, but in other many different ways, rights of access and everything. And 71% of the world's population live in countries where inequality has grown. Food security, in 2019, almost 10% of people in the world were exposed to severe levels of food insecurity, meaning they could not secure at least one meal per day. Has anybody heard the term stone soup? Do you know what a stone soup is? Stone soup is what they do in the, you know, yes, because you're married to me, that's why you know. <laughs> so stone soup is what women do in the favelas in Brazil when they have a child that is crying and they cannot sleep because they're hungry. What they do is that they put in a can some stones and water and they start, you know, um, mixing it around. So the children think that there will be a meal there and they fall asleep so they can sleep beside their hunger. It's a horrible thing. I'm getting goosebumps. Sorry? Yeah, exactly. Um, some more the burden of disease, obviously. Um, it is rooted very much in poverty, in poor nutrition, indoor air pollution, proper sanitation, health and education. Climate change, I don't need to explain much. Everybody understands how important it is. The effects that climate change has on how we live and how we produce and how our economy goes are huge. 
And biodiversity loss, I consider it, and not only me, but the UN in general, consider it an equally important and dangerous effect as climate change, actually. Mm -hmm. Think of it in terms of, of biodiversity. It's like you have um, a hammock that you're, you're sleeping on, right? And, you're, and you start taking out one thread, and then another thread, and another thread, a species, and a species, and a species. At one point, this whole thing will crash. And this is what happens when you lose biodiversity. You don't have the natural systems that can support life. So for all of this, uh, I want to show you two pictures only. One picture, this is the growth of cities. This is a very interesting graph. That's why I'm showing it. It's how much population grows every hour in some places. Every hour meaning how many newborns you have and how many die. Now, the difference of this is the numbers you see. So you have in Lagos 85 new lives every hour. In Kinshasa, 63. In Mumbai, 51. In Delhi, 79. The only place that has a negative number is Tokyo, minus one. So in Tokyo, you actually have a reduction of the population. But this means that those cities will become huge cities. They will require a lot of resources, a lot of management practices. Because if you come up with a city of 60 million, how do you run the damn thing? It's very complicated. Okay, It's six times the population of this country. The other thing that I was telling you about population and education in Africa, look at this. This is a graph that shows that currently we have 1.2 billion people in Africa and 7.3 in the whole population in the world. If we have a rapid evolution of the education process in Africa, this means that the 1.2 will become 1.9 by 2060 and the whole population will be 8.9. If we stick with what is happening today, this increase will go up to 2.5 billion in an overall 9.6 billion in all of the world. And if the current process of education in Africa crashes, if we take steps back, which we do in many cases because of poverty, because of hunger, because of COVID, that means that the overall population goes to 3.2 billion and the global population to 11 billion. So the education specifically of women, young women and girls, is very important because it has to do to a very large extent, with birth control as well. Now, let's see the megatrends again. You remember the seven megatrends that we saw. Let's see them in connection to AI and how AI could be the potential and the source of solutions for that. Let's take urban growth. As we said before, 70% of human population goes to megacities. One or two ways that we have already in, in place is, for example, this one which is real-time imagery points that allow you to have emergency response. Think of, of um, a little bit further developed Google Maps that actually shows you what, which are the escape routes when something happens, how the emergency services can come through, where they should come through, where you have a flooded area and they cannot go through and they will be blocked. We had this thing in Greece over the last two years with a snowfall. If you had a system like that, people would not have been blocked for two or three or four days or this sad thing that happened in this country. So actually, these are uh, solutions that help us manage cities that are existing AI. It's not things of the future or something we have to dream of. The other thing is the management of utilities for cities. Management of utilities becomes very, very complicated. I was speaking with a friend yesterday who told me that the sewage system in London has been designed in 1880. Uh, by um, Brunel, an engineer, a British engineer, it has now reached its full capacity. It was designed for 2 million and now it's serving 20 million people. So when you have these systems breaking down, you need to have artificial intelligence to help you resolve these problems in time. Because if it crashes, in the specific case of the sewage system in London, you're in deep shit. So you have to do something about it. Uh, same thing, girls' education. Look at the opportunity that you may have by having automatically translated curricula, for example. Or you have curricula that can be adapted very quickly and very efficiently to local needs, to local content, or specifically in cases where you might have young women and young girls that because of social uh, restriction are not allowed to go to school. Try Afghanistan and the Taliban. Uh, they are not allowed to go to school because they're girls specifically, or they don't have access to that. But in Africa, for example, everyone practically now has access to a mobile phone. Everyone. It's the, growest, the, the fastest growing use of mobile phones. Through this, you can advance, actually, education and not have the problems that we were saying before. 
Food security, same thing. In many places, we said that we have a lot of food security problems. Two things that you can do through AI is, for example, one of them is to have a quick and very efficient way of looking into uh, weather patterns, weather phenomena that might be the critical point between have or not have food for the next year. And then you might also be able to use specific appliances. Things like this normally cost not more than $10. That is a thing that actually measures, gives you information, and it helps the farmers without them needing to go to a special school, actually secure their production, secure their livelihoods. Securing livelihoods means no hunger. It also means that they will not have to migrate to another place in the world. And migration, when it comes to millions, is a big problem, of course, for them who are the migrants first, but also for the receiving countries. Burden of disease, many of you will know much better than I do how artificial intelligence is an enabler for progress in healthcare, but also it is uh, the disease surveillance and addressing disease. We saw that with COVID, there were many cases where AI was very, very efficient in actually helping humanity address such a big case. Um, climate change, two things that we have seen, two examples again, is the Earth Engine. Earth Engine is one developed by Google. Again, this is a pro project that we are working together with Google that gives you the possibility to use imagery, so just pictures of the of, of, that you take from satellites, and explain a lot of things about the trends and the forecasting of sea, greenhouse gas emissions, green cover and forest, forest fires, all of these things. So all of these things can be addressed in a much, much better way by using artificial intelligence. You don't need to write very much because I will give you this presentation. So, no, please, please. But, uh, and the other thing, for example, is that we are looking at how we can use geospatial data so that when we deploy renewable energy um, installations, this is not done to the detriment of the natural environment. Because you have heard a lot of the discussion. If we put their uh, wind farms or PV, it's very bad for the local species and for biodiversity and everything. There are ways that you can do it, but you need to use a lot of data analytics to be able to do it. AI is super helpful for that. By diversity loss, two examples. One is the program Razor. Razor is a thing that is done in Austria, and they use a lot of sensors and a lot also of um, uh, flying equipment and so on that monitors the development and the uh, species of, of, uh, of, of biodiversity that is at risk. And so they have a fully deployed system that know what are the trends, how, what is happening with endangered species and so on, and they can manage them. The other example is a company we had the honor to work with, which is called Pelagic Data Systems. Pelagic is a system that monitors how fishing practices go, and they can be very efficient because they have super high density data to manage the fishing effort, how it, it, it can be done. In this case, they were very, very effective in protecting one uh, species that was threatened with extinction called vaquita. It's a species of dolphin in the Gulf of Mexico that was actually caught accidentally in nets time over time over time. And they managed to design a pattern of how fishing should go so that vaquita would not be um, threatened anymore. And it worked. It was one of the very, very uh, highly uh, read articles in National Geographic at the time. Um, these are some examples, but what I would like now to do is take one minute break and ask any of you if you can think of any way that you can imagine AI supporting humanity to deal with any of those infrastructure, inequalities, communities, climate action. Do you have any thoughts in mind that we could use AI to address that? Yes, please. By? Heart attacks. Heart attacks. Fantastic. Fantastic. And I think not only heart attacks, could be many other things, yeah. Okay, super. Any other ideas? You don't have to. Yes, please. Exactly. And everywhere, there is this notion of the smart forest that we are now discussing on. And smart forest is the idea of having a <coughs> very good mapping of the existing conditions of drought, wind, humidity. And if it is a very high risk case, then you know that you have to stand by because something bad could happen. So these are some cases, but there is also a bigger picture. 
And one bigger picture is that the cloud-based AI can give a lot of meaning to the data that we collect for the SDGs and information. What do I mean by giving meaning to the SDG data? One is that it can provide guidance and solutions by processing the data. As we said, if we want to protect forests, then we know what is happening in the full forest cover of a country or even, I mean, a whole, a whole um, a geographical entity. Take, for example, the forest fires that we have in Canada these days and be able to know why things are happening, to take precautionary action and to address them better. The second is to monitor and progress by analyzing aggregate data and additional information and imagery. This, I want to stick to this for a second, because this kind of analyzing aggregate data can give us, in terms of the SDGs, a very important thing. And you will remember this in the very last slide that I will mention, uh, Yuval Hariri, uh, Harari. Um, one thing that we're trying to do through the data that we collect for the SDGs is to, to reach a point of what we call causality. Causality, a lot of you will know what it is, is to find the cause and effect. So which action creates which result. And in terms of sustainability, this is very important because we don't have full knowledge on how our actions impact sustainability in terms of climate, in terms of food, in terms of all of these things. If with the help of AI analysis of this data, we can find the correlation, but a sensible correlation, then we can plan our policies and our action in a much better way. And this is very, very important. Um, let's now see the other side, the flip side of the, of the coin. I'll try to be done by 2, 10 or something like this. Uh, the flip side of the coin is that a lot of people, as we said before, have seen artificial intelligence as a danger and not a solution. And let's see some statistics. This is very interesting. This is where the countries are looking at the danger, which is the gray part, major or extreme concern about potential AI risks. And the blue one is who are fully prepared to address potential AI risks. One of the worst countries in this graph is France. I mean, you will tell me in France they were considering hamburger as a danger. So, you know. Um, but still, there's a lot of skepticism. The only two countries that we have in this graph that are uh, fully prepared, and this is higher than the risk part, is Germany and China to a very, very high extent. This is a very interesting graph. Yes, please. Uh, it's actually for China. It's No, this is the view of the citizens. Okay. This is, yeah, yeah, this because is the view I'm of the citizens. That they are uh, fully prepared to address yeah. the risks. Yeah. Okay. But obviously, government policy has a lot to do with citizens' view in this case. So thank you for the clarification. Yeah. Yes. But still, we see that there is a lot of, of skepticism. And skepticism, I mean, previous speakers have explained all this much better than me. But there is a reason. Um, there is some reason if it's not done properly. So, for example, medical data is about very valuable and very important personal information. So what I'm taking as an example here is imagine when AI allows us to forecast and report on vital aspects in one's health. So you might be able, by having the data that I have, to know my life expectancy, that I will live up to 70 or up to 65 years or up to 105 like my grandfather, which I doubt. Um, vulnerability to disease or environmental conditions, and cause of reputational or financial loss that can come out of all this. This is very important. And if I don't feel secure about this, then I see it as a risk. It's normal. So I need to feel secure about that. The other thing is that if this data is used through AI to monitor what I do, then it can have a very high effect on my life. For example, in my insurance cost or in the options that I will have for hospitalization. Because if I'm considered like, uh, you know, the least probable case that hospitalization could deal with, they will either charge me a lot or not accept me, not, not take me in. And of course, there is a lot of indirect effects that are very important. So employability or employment, hugely important. Uh, migration profile. Migration profile could be a discerning line between who is allowed to enter a country and who is not. We have seen this in the past, uh, in the times of the big migration, for example, in countries like Australia or remember the Ellis Island? They were doing a medical test. And if you were not very good in terms of medical profile, you were not allowed to enter the US. Yes, please. But these are not problems of the AI per se. They are problems of uh, how we choose to, to deal with, uh, 
so it's, it's not a matter of the problems of insurance cost. The AI is a tool to make more precise uh, uh, predictions about the cost, but the problem is that we don't have public health care, no? Absolutely. But think of the, of the case where I, as I wouldn't wish to be, I'm Elon Musk, and I have all this information, and then I have uh, a lot of control over the medical system. If I can tell whether she is a better patient than you are a better patient, she will get preference. And of course, this is where the problem is, it's how you use the data, not that you have. And that's why we said this is a deja vu problem. I mean, it is, but it's a matter of how you use it. And then there are also personal life choices. Uh, I mean, maybe Christina, if she knew my medical profile, she would never have married me. I don't know. <laughs> no. <laughs> um, and in order to avoid what you said, and thank you very much for the segue, there are two very important fundamental conditions. One of them is that the value of data should be in aggregates, not in individuals. If we want to provide solutions, we must aggregate data and do the statistics or analytics or what you want to call them and be able to draw the... the um, conclusions that will help us develop policies, develop technologies, all the things that we need to do, but not turn it against the one individual that is doing this or use it, you know, to his or her detriment. The second is that this information, private information, needs to be private, both in terms of who knows it in the market, but also who knows it in the government. This is very important because, again, government can be a friend or a foe depending on how information is used and, and how you know, democratic countries and so on and so forth. Uh, we have seen a lot of, of these cases where people were under um, pressure, let's say, from a government and they had to migrate and it did create a lot of problems for them and still does. And what I'd like to underline here is this, that says that democracy is when citizens have full privacy and governments have full transparency. When you have the opposite, you have a very big problem. And I put this up here because this is also connected to the SDGs. You have SDG 16 that is about institutions, justice, and so on. And if you don't fulfill these conditions, then everything that you do and use the AI for is not in a sustainable way. Two final bits. One thing is some reading. I will share this presentation with you so you will be able to go and see these very interesting articles that I have selected for you, uh, how AI can help achieving the SDGs in many different ways. So we don't stick to that. And two final things. One is that we need AI to be able to address the SDGs. And why do I say we need? First of all, uh, you may remember that the Sustainable Development Goals were uh, planned to be what the UN called the uh, Agenda 2030. That meant that the world had agreed that we will try to reach those goals by 2030. Guess what? We will not. Um, and we will not because we do not do enough because we had COVID that stalled things, because now we have the war in Ukraine that creates even more problems, because, I mean, we can find a lot of reasons why, but we will not. And one of the proofs of this thing is this graph that is very interesting. What this graph shows is the rate of, um, of uh, pressure on, on the um, resources on the, on the planet, and this is the Human Development Index. When you reach 0 0.8, you have the very high human development index, and this is the carrying capacity of the planet. So what you see here is that most of the developing countries, India, Indonesia, and so on, are still not taking too much of their resources, but they're still lagging very much behind in human development as well. Then you have some developing countries that are taking a lot of resources, and they're trying to reach this high level of human development, and then you have the developed countries, all of the red ones are the European Union countries, and then you have USA and Japan and so on, that are taking a lot, a lot of resources. Normally, every country should be here, and none of them is. So we need to find the ways, technologies, solutions that we try to bring the development of humanity right there. We use less resources, we have better conditions of living for humanity. And the final point I want to share with you is this phrase by Yuval Harari that I mentioned before. Yuval Harari, you'll know him, he's a philosopher. I think he's a, sometimes a wise as well, but he's a philosopher. And he says some very interesting things. One is that, he says, perhaps most importantly, artificial intelligence and biotechnology are giving humanity the power to reshape and re-engineer life. 
This is huge. Reshape and re-engineer life. It's more than technology. And very soon somebody will have to decide how to use this power based on some implicit or explicit story about the meaning of life. Philosophers are very patient people. Engineers are far less patient and investors are the least patient of all. I love this thing because it's so true. And then he says, if you don't know what to do with the power of, to engineer life, market forces will not wait a thousand years for you to come up with an answer. They will step in and they will do it. And so the invisible hand of the market will force upon you its own blind reply. And then God help you because you know what will be decided will not be fair, will not be just, will not be all of these things. And this is what I wanted to close with, that we do need AI to help us implement sustainable development goals and, and ways to address the presence of humanity on the planet in a more sustainable way for all. Um, it is not, I mean, the market is a thing that is considered like, you know, a nebulous thing that is out there, but it's you through the work that you do, either as, as legal experts or inventors or business people or everything that will actually create this. So if we just th stay back and think and say, mm, AI is a problem, we need to find ways to regulate and everything. No, regulation will not be the first to come. It's what we will propose as solutions out of that. And with this, happy lunch. Thank you very much. Thank you.